Let me start with this. I got no bombshells, no news. There's nothing dramatic. I'm not dying. I'm not selling the company. We're not going public. We're not changing our name. There's, there's nothing to worry about, all right? In fact, the next 10 years are going to be better than the last 10, believe it or not. I played with the language. I wanted to tell you why we're here today, but it's not, I don't, I don't have the why. I mean, you're the why, we feel the why, we know the why, we are the why. But, but I guess what I want to explain is what triggered it. And uh, this is an aside, it's really not important, but I just want to give you a sense of how come now and, and, and here and today and 10-year affiliates. And what happened was um, a couple of months ago we got off social media. Anyone remember that? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the, we, we gave some reasons. I think they were completely legitimate. I think that company is fundamentally evil. Um, and there was the rationale for it. You can find that on .com. It's, uh, each one of those was more than enough reason. I never got Facebook anyway. I never, I never really understood it. But the selling of our information, and I mean, look at, go through the list. I'm not gonna, that's not why we're here to talk about Facebook. But what was amazing was that we got an overwhelmingly positive response from mainstream media, which I never expected would happen. I should have, because I get now that, that, that social media and mainstream media are at war with one another and see each other competitors. But from all over the world, and just about every major media outlet held us up as heroes for getting off of fucking Facebook. And I thought, that's really weird, because mainstream media has never liked anything we have ever done. And here we are getting, getting the ultimate praise and from around the world, and it scared me. It gave me reason to really check our shit. Uh-oh, maybe we fucked up. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with all of that. And so we said, well, geez, who doesn't like this? And so I talked to the affiliate team, and I actually found a few affiliates that were upset at the move. And one in particular, um, that I, I knew well, I knew, I knew these, these young men from, from their inception, from the start. They're, they're good trainers, they're good kids, they got a good box. And uh, do we have that line? Do we have that sentence? You're, this, by the way, this is Brian Mulvaney and Russ Green here, looking like deer in the headlights. I don't, I don't know if you know them or not, but Brian has to listen to more of me than probably anyone on earth. I mean, he's, he's, he's well paid for that. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and Russ is my evil monster that we keep in Washington, D.C. to so fuck bad guys up. Um, I raised him from a, from a, from a wee lad. He's, he was a client at what age? Uh, 14. 14 years old. Yeah. And now he's, what, 26? <laughs> what are you? 32. 32. 32. <laughs> Same thing. Um, it's amazing. This kid, he's, he's not going to remember not working for us. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I'm proud to be here with both of them on the stage. I'm also starting to doubt why I'm paying an affiliate fee if there isn't any marketing outside your traditional affiliate finder on the website. I was like, holy fucking cow, wait a minute, what do you think we're doing, boys? So I had them out. I put their butts on airplanes and I had them out and we sit and talk and they, they don't think like that anymore. We fix that thinking. But it, is, but it is the motivation and the inspiration for being here today. And we've got quite a story to tell. There's a lot of details. It's a, it's a, it's a very complicated kind of thing. And uh, I refer to very complicated stories where the narrative is going to be intense, where you've got all the moving parts of a John Grisham novel. We've referred to this before as a hairball. And do we got my hairball here? There it is, that's a hairball. And you can see there's a target in the center and a starting point, an X, and the first rule of narratives, this is my rule, first rule of narratives, is you can tell a complicated story starting almost from anywhere and cover all of it. You can start at the end, you can start at the middle, you can work your way out, there's all kinds of possibilities. And I got a problem here that you don't want to sit here for six, seven hours and listen to me, so I gotta wrap this into something that's kind of tight and works. And so I just kind of somewhat arbitrarily decided that I would start our discussion at uh, October 15th. And in particular, um, October, what do you see? I got this date here. 
It's a Thursday, 15th of October, 2.30 p.m. in Washington, D.C., okay? And uh, so we're going to start on the 15th, and uh, what happened was we met Dr. Axel Pfluger for the first time. And Dr. Pfluger, <laughs> that's a great picture of him, he's, a, <laughs> he's an MD, he's a PhD. Any of them seen him on the website know who I'm talking about? Show of hands if you know who Axel is. Put your hands up if you don't. Good, that makes it even more fun. Um, Axel hit me up with an, with, in an email, and he says, I have a proposal that you won't be able to say no to. And just as I was reaching for the delete, I noticed that, because I was going to say no real quick, um, I didn't want to hear it, but I saw that he was a nephrologist. And we had uh, put ourselves in the company of some brilliant nephrologists in undoing the hyperhydration, exercise-associated hyponatremic encephalopathy carnage that was created by Gatorade and Pepsi in conjunction with the American College of Sports Medicine. And uh, uh, I like nephrologists. They, they never bought into the hyperhydration campaign. They never believed for a moment that uh, hydration would be prophylactic against exertional cramping or uh, heat injury. They knew that going in. And so when Gatorade and the American College of Sports Medicine convinced the world that hydration would protect you from, from cramping and protect you from heat injury, the nephrology community knew that was a load of shit. And so I thought I'd give him the benefit. I'm in DC anyways, he's in New York. I said, here's the deal. I'm gonna be there on the 14th and 15th. If you come on the 15th at 2.30 p.m., we'll sit and talk. And he came and he, and he sat and talked with us. And uh, he was right, I was wrong. He had a proposal I couldn't resist. And what he did is he went on, by the way, this guy is board certified in cardiology, board certified in nephrology, board certified in internal medicine, and he was running the Mayo Clinic's uh, diabetes and chronic disease treatment program for 16 years, 15 of which they were, according to US News and World Report, what the fuck do they know, it's the number one treatment center in the world. And he shared with us the, in, in a handful of wonderful graphs, the clinical outcome of 30,000 patients monitored over a six or seven year period. And what he was able to show us, and he asked me, you know what this is? And I go, well, I'm looking at A1C, a whole shit ton of people, and it looks like they're kind of getting worse over the years. And he says, yeah, what you're looking at is a non-clinical outcome in a treatment. We are babysitting 30,000 people towards their inexorable demise having no significant effect. Look at this guy, he got better, this one died. You're way more likely to drop dead than you were to get better. And what he did is he went out to try and find what it was behind those that did get better, that, that rid themselves of type two diabetes. And what he found, it only happens with a lifestyle change. So then he started hunting for where that lifestyle change would be found. And it was fascinating, he did this through searching through Google, looking for hypertension, looking for weight loss, looking for diabetes reversal. And he found on CrossFit properties, I think the number was 262 references to chronic disease reversal. And he didn't quite understand what we were doing nutritionally or the exercise yet, that was foreign to him, but he knew that we had the answer and we knew we were pe making people well and he knew from their testimonials on our website. So he said to me, you have the answer in a thick German accent I played with, but I'm not gonna do it. And I took enough German to pull it off maybe, but I'm not gonna do it. But we had the answer, he tells me, and his proposal was total CrossFit. And you know what that is? That's bringing CrossFit to the masses to prevent and reverse chronic disease rather than wasting time with all these fucking games athletes. Where's Tia, honey? <laughs> I invented the games, I love them. But I also know there's no one that's been unlocking their doors for 10 years because the people they're sent into the games. Right? Show of hands if that resonates. <clears throat> I would go to the games or any event I went at, and I'd, the reception line forms where people want to say hi to me and tell me their stories, and I would spot one of you in the crowd, and inevitably, your message to me was, you know, it's not about the games in my box. Like, I didn't fucking know that. And, I, and I, was, I was hating on you for thinking that I didn't know and having to tell me. And so we, we took some, some moves to fix that. And anyone notice any of that? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm super pleased with all of it. But 
So we're on the 15th here. He tells me, you got to do the total CrossFit. You got to save lives. And by the way, he's now a CrossFitter. He's deadlifting and, and he's carb restricted and the good doctor's one of us. Um, but that's, that is a, a landmark, a moment in, in my thinking, in our development, that precipitated two other events that were significant. And I'm going to jump to the next date here. And that is three months later on the 27th of January um, at uh, University of Virginia Medical School. At, um, I did a grand, grand rounds there. There's me at the medical school. We had the dean of medicine. We had the uh, chairs of just about every department. The head of nephrology was there. Mitch Rosner, who's a friend of ours now and a CrossFitter. He was instrumental in our unfucking the hyperhydration campaign of Gatorade. Um, a brilliant nephrologist. And uh, he asked me to come and talk to the medical students, to the medical faculty, the chief residents, the auditorium full of people. And it was the first time I did the five buckets of death presentation. Show of hands if you've seen that. And hands if you love this. This is cool. This is cool. Um, you haven't been paying attention, and it's my fault. Okay, but we're gonna we're gonna fix that. Um, here's what I did. I put up five containers. They never looked that good. It was more like this, just for full uh, disclosure here. And I'd leave them un unlabeled. And what I would do is ask these medical students, these uh, medical professors, the dean of medicine. And by the way, our Mitch Rosner is not just head of nephrology at University of Virginia, but he is dean of medicine at the at the medical school. And what I did is I asked them to just throw at me any kind of manner of death. And we played that game for about 15 or 20 minutes. And everything fit pretty nicely into one of these buckets, or it had an etiology that was somewhat unknown. And then we reveal what's in the buckets. And the first one's chronic disease. And the second one is microbic, genetic, kinetic, and toxic. And so we'll come back to the chronic disease. Microbic, all the bugs, right? Virus, bacteria, prion, all that shit, right? Amoeba, anything. Um, genetic, you picked the wrong parents, and now you're paying for it, okay? Um, kinetic, this is, the, this is the wheel that comes off the car and the freeway going the other way, and it goes through the windshield, and you're done. I, had, I looked that up. I want to see, does that happen? And I actually found a YouTube video from a dashboard cam of a, a wheel coming off of a car on the freeway going the other direction, and it bounce, 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 clears the center divider, and about 150 yards out, takes one more bounce, and I think it's a millisecond later, it's in the front seat. And, it, and he, there was no reaction. I think if he had seen it, he probably would have ducked into it and it would have decapitated him. But I go here because what we have on this right side are largely accidents. Largely accidents. Look, you get a bug, it's, you know, I, I, you, you get Ebola, it's probably nothing you did. Same with the flu, right? You follow me? Bad parents, not your fault. Um, this is all the physical accidents. Again, likely not your fault, and to be poisoned. Probably, probably didn't play a big role personally in that. The chronic diseases, what we've identified is that they have two causes, and it's sedentarism and excessive consumption of refined carbohydrate, and the solution is get off the carbs, off the fucking couch. And when? Right now. Right away. Right away. Um, fascinating, this is 86% of the medical spend. And these collectively are about 14%. Um, this is at least 70% of deaths. It may, be, it may be rising towards 85 or 90. Depends on who's doing the estimating here. The CDC isn't quite frank on this. But the key on the divide here is that this illness demands complicity on your part to manifest. It is the result of willful behaviors that are, in fact, pathological. Staying on the couch, all your waking moments watching television, that's what most people that are couch bound are doing, they're watching TV, is, is a pathological behavior and it results in death. Excessive consumption of refined carbohydrate is, again, probably addictive, certainly acts that way. I mean, there are people who are presented with a long, healthy life for chocolate cake, and they're taking a fucking cake. <laughs> this problem is so simple, so simple, and yet getting off the couch and off the carbs would be the hardest thing you ever do. 
hardest thing you ever do. And it was neat to sit there and have all these medical students and physicians and faculty. By the way, we've done this now at three or four, maybe four or five medical schools and other groups, including for Google Health. And nobody's going to change anything until we can get people off the carbs and off the couch and put a dent in here. And you know, you've got doctors in the room. I see Michael Ray here. Um, so much of what doctors are so unhappy about is this. Nobody went to medical school, I contend, to babysit someone's diabetes into early death. You, go, you went to medical schools, you wanted to heal people, right, Doc? You wanted to cure them, no? Make them better. Nothing could be more important, I don't think. And, the, and, and to look at this, I want to share something with you. There isn't another alternative. We're not, there's not, no one's going to address chronic disease absent getting people off the fucking couch, off the carbs, and very likely isn't going to happen outside of a group setting, the supportive community. That's, that's the belief, that the, that the community are out, portion of this is critical, is essential. But you know, that's the mojo we don't really even think about, right? I mean, it's just there. You unlock the doors in the morning and everyone's there and they love each other. I know that. I know what it's like in your box. Now, so we meet Pfluger. We start with the five buckets of death, seeing if anyone has any objection to that. I mean, really, is it just that simple? There's no, been no objection to it. No, there's not been one faculty member at one of four or five medical schools that's raised their hand and said, yeah, there's a problem with your model here. So we go from that to the actuary, and the next thing I realize is that, you know, we got to do this total CrossFit thing. We have to make what we do available for the broader, for the, for, for the world, globally. And one of the things we did playing on that is we imagined a Gaussian distribution of physical capacity. It really doesn't sit that way in, in culture. It isn't, a, it isn't a normal distribution. Can we put that up? The gold platinum. I did this with Pat and Joe and some of my, and Brian, Russ. We sat around, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to partition, um, you know, I wanted to look at, at various levels of physical capacity in a normal distribution. There would be as many of the extremely unfit as there would the super fit. And I didn't want to use F, D, C, B, and A, you know, it's because no one wants to be F fitness. So we said, geez, how do we, how do we put a good rap on F fitness? And we're like, well, let's, let's look at the five most precious metals in the world. And there they are. It's gold, platinum, osmium, rhodium, and californium. And the gold people are those that are marginally ambulatory, cane, walker, help up under the arm to get to the bathroom. And on the other end, in the Californium, we've got uh, games athletes, Tia and her friends, <laughs> sit out that, on that side of things. We actually, for 400 meters, for a 2,000 meter row, we actually came up with some, what we thought were comparable demarcations of the division between each of those. And that big osmium group is kind of just your run-of-the-mill member. And it's these people that can do Fran somewhere between five minutes and 20 minutes, right? But they can do it. And we've got in that platinum group, these are people that are clearly ambulatory, but you wouldn't call them highly mobile. They're not fast. They, there's something, you know, that still needs to be worked out. And, and we asked ourselves, like, what are we going to do to go get those people? How do we get more of them? Because the truth of the matter is, is that the stimulus that is CrossFit, the constantly varied high intensity functional movement, and the meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar, has its greatest impact down there at that far end. And what would happen if we started looking at see how far along we could take that people rather than just celebrate those that are out there with Tia and Matt and the, and the other superstars? And so we started, one of the first things I told Sevi to do was I don't want any more games athletes on the front end. I want normal folks. I want folks that need the stimulus and need the help. And we started in Santa Cruz, what we're calling CrossFit Underserved, we started a program where we're only working with the morbidly obese and the geriatric uh, client. And we got over 100 of them, and it's growing. Um, we're having a blast with it. Uh, two people have already lost over 100 pounds, and we're learning a lot. Michelle, Michelle, you here? She's not here? She's working this weekend? Michelle, who's a, a flu 
master on the level one team and is also a physical therapist by training, who is kind of heading the program. Pat's doing a satellite thing in Seattle, and Joe Westerlin, another flow master, is uh, doing something similar in Omaha, Nebraska. And we're sharing notes. We're bringing the best of our training cadre through to watch what this looks like. Um, we've made some brilliant contributions to the training of, of these folks, and I'm, I'm going to share that with you. Not here today, but we're, we're you know, we, we promised them that we weren't bringing them into our midst to, to, to make spectacle of them for, for everybody. And so we've not shared um, what it might have been nice to share quite, but they're warming up to us, and they're getting increasingly uh, comfortable with that. And so we're going to start showing more and more and more. But... Uh, uh, it was interesting in the collecting of them. We used Facebook. I think it was one of the last things that we did on Facebook. But uh, I said, I want fat people and old people. And we we're like, well, okay, let's, just, hey, if you're really fat or really old, we want you. you know? And I said, nah, that's not that good. That's like F fitness, right? We can polish that up a little. And the language we used was if you consider yourself the least likely person to ever go into a CrossFit gym, we want to meet you and talk to you. And they came forward. Guess what came forward? Mostly really old and really fat people. You know, not really old and really fat. That doesn't happen too often. But we had a lot of really old people, and we got a bunch of really fat people. And here's what we're doing. We're making the fat people lighter. So we're fixing that, just fixing it. And I'm not going to tell you that we're making the old people younger, but I'm going to tell you that we have people doing things that they do 15 years ago but could 20 years ago. And boy, if that's not getting younger, it's close enough. It's probably better than just rolling back the clock, right? Regain capacity like what? Like going to ground and coming up. We have a young lady who says, I went to the ground for the first time willingly and got back up yesterday. Thank you. 11 years since I'd done that. 11 years. I go, How do you know it was 11 years? She goes, because the paramedics came to the house and put me back on the couch. <laughs> Tragic. Not anymore. I watched her the other day get down on both knees and play with a little puppy that was tied to the up tied up in the gym and get back up and let me tell you how we started with her because this was brilliant um we got bill and katie here managers billy how are you buddy we took that soft plyo box at about 40 inches and we just had her come up with her crutches canes whatever you call those that go on the what do you call those doc that cane crutch crutches, crutches. <laughs> okay she had a pair of those and she'd present herself to the box at 450 pounds or whatever it was, and then put the crutches down and then just lean forward onto the box and then struggle to come back to her feet. And in a year, we turned that into minus 125 pounds and getting all the way to the ground and back up, which is what? If we're honest, it's a burpee, is it not? I'm not a fan of the fucking burpee. Let me tell you why. <laughs> I had two or three people develop a lumbar disc injury from burpees. And so we kind of quit doing them. But now you come back to the old folks, and man, they got to get to ground and back up. But it's not, they're not going to come up with enough force that they're going to roll under and, and excessively flex the lumbar spine trying to get their feet underneath them. They don't ever go through that posture. But it is. You know, and, and it was so interesting that we've found no one anywhere that's teaching uh, those that are, that are non-ambulatory to go to ground and get back up. No one's teaching that. Now, let's ask ourselves this as 10-year affiliates, as, as, as the best trainers on earth. Do you think that practicing going to ground and getting back up would have an impact on the propensity to lose your balance and fall or your capacity to get back up if you did fall? Is there anyone that doubts that for a fucking second? Of course it does, right? I'm not going to wait for anyone to prove it. We're just going to keep doing it. And it's so much fun. It's so cool to see. One of the things we realized, your instincts were to bring these people to carpeting. Because we're trying to, trying to, to decontextualize the gym and show how this stuff can be done at home. And so we went to carpeting. Um, you don't want super old people going to ground and coming back up on carpeting. Pick the linoleum. The problem was that the carpet was abrasive and it denuded the forearm of flesh in two of our senior athletes. And the linoleum didn't do that. So that's counterintuitive, right? We're learning a lot about these people and we're having a blast with them. And it's really nothing that any of you couldn't do. 
I'm gonna share something with you. I wanted these people, I wanted the experience, I wanted the exposure, I wanted to bring the training cadre through to see them worked on, and we're not charging these people. So there's not a business here. Now, interestingly, I would have told you, because we say this all the time, that without making them pay, they won't attach value to it, and so it won't be appreciated. Well, I'll tell you what, it isn't the case with these people. Their appreciation and gratitude is frankly overwhelming. And they're coming from a long ways away to come here. Now, what would that look like in, a, in a, an affiliate? Because, you know, I have means. I've got a big box and training staff, and I'm taking credit for the training and doing none of it. <laughs> so I've got a very different kind of scenario than you. But what would that look like in your case? I'll tell you what it would look like. It would be finding an hour a week, Wednesdays at 2 p.m. when it's quiet anyways, to bring people in that are in special need of this, those people for whom, those people at that gold and platinum space, and give an hour. Get your best trainer to give an hour. I would, I did, we did a lot, a lot of scholarship, a lot. I would tell people, I'm gonna put you on a scholarship, because you, you, don't, you, don't, you can't rub two cents together, I'm gonna put you on a scholarship, and there's only one thing you can do to fuck your scholarship up, and that's let anyone know you're on a scholarship, because I don't want everyone coming to me wanting to be on a scholarship. But I had about a quarter of my people were probably on scholarship. I probably had another quarter that were being paid for by a local billionaire who was in love with me and the program. That's pretty good, right? You've all got things like that going on. I hear the stories all the time. So we made a strong commitment down to that far end. We're seeing it work. We're having a blast with it. But from that October 15th date of the meeting of Fluger, the five buckets of death, making the decision to do all of this, it also created a powerful need for us to, to revamp the website. It needs to reflect the values and the realities that are consistent with you having an elegant solution to the world's greatest problem. And the offering prior to 1901-01, as of last year, I didn't think the website made that. And we planned on the change on the website for about six, eight months, um, worked about 10 or 15 of us, putting in long days. Um, the publishing pattern, I'm not gonna get into 1901-01 right now, I'm gonna come back to that but there was a commitment made to revamp the website to do something very important. And there's a phenomenon that's known as the life cycle of a technology adoption. Um, and there's a notion that's called jumping the chasm from early adopters. I'm gonna pull that slide up here. And right there, and this is something that, that Facebook, Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, everyone's had to do. And that is you have to jump the chasm between early adopters to the mainstream to get an early majority, and most startups fail somewhere there. And we recognized that we indeed were in that position, and that what we did is we were there on the early adopter side, and what I had is a whole bunch of crazy fuckers that really enjoyed that that contributed to our reputation of being dangerous, and that is my games fanatics and the competition friend, and the people that loved the puking clown and the, the two-minute friends and all that. And, and all of that was exacerbated significantly by the NSCA, the ACSM, Soda Pop, I'm gonna come back to the, to the collection of assholes later. But we sat there with our early adopters and frankly our reputation globally was of being dangerous. And, but the reality is, is that we weren't dangerous, what we were providing was essential. We have, we're not dangerous, you have unique possession of an elegant solution to the world's greatest problem. That's the opposite of danger. Essential meaning that optimal functioning of the organism isn't possible without it. Without what? Without getting off the couch and reducing your carb intake. And so we set about to, to change that reputation if we could, very deliberately. And you know what? We did it. Anyone notice the, the rush of mainstream media about CrossFit and the seniors and elderly? Have you seen that? It's not been the big outlets, but, it's, but interestingly, it's been some kind of smaller outfits that actually cater to the elderly or the obese. So we've got publications that are designed for the elderly, designed for the obese, saying that CrossFit is an outstanding tool to make these differences. And in fact, just last month, a paper was published in a journal of sports and communication. Imagine that. It's, uh, Academic Journal on Sport and Communication. Hard to say without giggling, but um, it was published and out of uh, 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 Brisbane, Australia, and we got that. 
right there, reinvention through CrossFit branded transformation documentaries. Here, Brigid, Bridget McCarthy is claiming that CrossFit has changed its reputation from dangerous to essential. Ha, we did it. We did it. Now, I want to back up. I want to go back to October 15th and the day before October 14th. Why were we there? And I mean, what, what the point of all of this is, I am acutely aware of what you do for a living. You save lives. You greatly improve them. And that happens concomitantly. Let's go back to the 14th. Why were we in DC? Well, I'll tell you what we were doing. We were doing our litigation, legislation, lobbying, and combating of lies, the big L. And there's no better place to do litigation, lobbying, uh, uh, <laughs> legislation, or, or, or battle liars than in Washington, DC. And what we were doing was two things. One is um, we were hot on the occupational licensure. I don't know if you know this or not, but an enormous sum of money has been spent to criminalize CrossFit training. Let me show just a list of those, if we can, from this morning. This has been going on since about 2005, I believe. Ooh, that's pretty. Um, none of those, one of those passed, the DC bill did. And the rest failed, but they have come up in, in many of the bicameral states and houses, both in the, in the Senate and in their Congress, in the state, Senate and State Assembly. And each time they've, it's come up, it's gotten further down the road, closer to passing. And um, I get the feeling that there's a little of that right now. Do you feel that? Yes. Yeah, and the people that were doing it are lying through their teeth saying we weren't doing it. One of those that was responding, we know that these have common authorship because the bills have big chunks of language. It's identical. And we were able to, the Podesta organization, um, remember that, John Podesta and crew? <sighs> Strange bedfellows politics. Those were our people, and they did great work for us. And as that thing circled the bowl and disappeared in a puff of smoke, um, we took several of their best, and now they're, they're working with us. But So we have, we have world-class lobbying, and uh, we actually reversed the DC bill. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, we've, 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 we've been able to, look at that, anti-licensing movement scores a victory. That's a page two story in the Wall Street Journal. And it turns out that only eight times in 40 years has an occupational licensure bill been, been, been reversed. And two of those eight, it got reversed back after being reversed. So six, six times has that been pulled off. And you did. See, I go to DC, I'm representing you. I hope you know that. Not me, I'm not training anyone, you are, I'm protecting you. And, and, and we got it reversed and we've actually went to the, 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 one of the very last ones presented was in the state of Massachusetts and we sent several very strong affiliates and several of our, of our staff and we put ourselves on the, on the floor and we got the bill killed. And it's the uh, consortium, it is, it's a consortium of the Registry of Exercise Professionals, CREPS, they're behind this thing. Um, it was the International Consortium of the Registry of Exercise Professionals that in Australia said that CrossFit had killed six people in the United States. And so we sued this asshole and won and he had to tell the whole world that he was an asshole and lied, you know? <laughs> so everyone in New Zealand could see that he was a lying asshole. Um, and, and these lying assholes are denying they had anything to do with the occupational licensure, and so is the American College of Sports Medicine. They're telling the world that we're absolutely against it. We know they did it. We know they did it, and we know how they paid for it. I'm gonna share with you, our fighting of the DC bill cost about $50,000 a month just to the lobbying group, and that went on for about a year and a half. And, and boy, that's, that's some hard uphill work. Um, but whoever put this together, whoever decided it was that 26 or 27 pieces of legislation needed to be crafted in nine states over 15 years, whoever did that was sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars to have that kind of influence to peddle. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. One estimate is about 225 million to say if you'd gone to, to a, a lobbying firm and said, here's what I want to do. I want to get legislation floored 24 times in nine states over 15 years. What are you going to charge for that? It's, a, it was, it's an amazing effort. We look at the people that are doing this thing and they don't have that kind of money. 
So you ask yourselves quite naturally, where would the money be coming from? Well, I'm going to go right to their gold and platinum sponsors, and that's the soda assholes. And so that put me on the road saying that ACSM and the NSCA are fucking soda whores. So you know what they did? They sued me, and they sued Russ, and they sued CrossFit for calling them soda whores. This is, this is NSCA versus CrossFit. And so suing us gave us the opportunity to, to, through discovery, to ask them for their communications with soda. They said they didn't have any. Well, we had powerful evidence that they did. This pissed off the judge. The judge didn't like the lying and ordered a forensic examination, investigation of their servers. This is the second time they'd happened to it. I'll come back to you about the first time. But uh, 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 what we saw, what we f found from Ernst & Young, who did the forensic examination, that there were millions of emails responsive to their relationship with Soda. And before we even got to look at them, they dropped the suit. They, there was an interesting phase where we were arguing what was meant by soda whore. And, they, and our attorney says it doesn't even have meaning. And they said, well, it does to us. And I go, well, let me weigh in on that. I'll explain exactly what I mean by a soda whore. That's not, that's not a problem. I'll tell you what was in the emails. It was convincing, damning evidence that they're fucking soda whores. That's what was going on. <laughs> and guess who showed up to deliver the message that we're going to make this all go away and make it right? Lanny Davis. Does anyone know who that is? Show of hands. He was there when Michael Cohen was, uh, was being grilled in, 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 in a congressional hearing, Trump's uh, attorney. That was Lanny Davis sitting behind him. It was Lanny Davis who was sitting next to Bill Clinton during his impeachment. Um, look him up. He's a fascinating man. But uh, they said that, that if you need to hire him, you're completely fucked. And, <laughs> He's been described as a soup full of manure. Um, he's probably the least popular lawyer in the world. And he just wanted nothing more than to talk to me, and we wouldn't let him. He's still trying to talk to me. We make him talk to our Latham Watkins attorneys instead. And we know, what, we know what he's being paid for this. We know he gets $150,000 a month to try and get us to walk away from our NSCA suit. We know the NSCA doesn't have the money to hire him. Who does? We've been litigating. First of all, let's talk about litigation, legislation, uh, lobbying. I talked about the lobbying effort and told you what we did there, immensely successful. Um, legislation, it's all been the combating of occupational licensure and uh, uh, probably some work on the nutrition front where the dietitians have gone after affiliates in Florida. We've teamed up with Institute for Justice there. Um, there's kind of a little more litigation. The legislation stuff has been largely defensive, but I would imagine that it would be inevitable where a time would come if we're successful enough that we'll be able to sponsor some of our own legislation and get into that space. But we've talked to all kinds of people on the Hill. If I watch CNN at night, I will almost every other see someone that we got in front of, and basically we were telling them that the soda people have, have look, here was my gripe again. First off, the fructose in it is a toxin. Second of all, they've corrupted the health and fitness space. And my third gripe, and this is the most important one, they spent a shit ton of money trying to fuck you up. And that's the one that really pissed me off. When I was at the Cato Institute, they said, you're a big libertarian, what's just anti-soda shit and all this? And I said, listen, if you live in my neighborhood and you're a drug dealer, I'm going to look the other way. But if my video camera shows you stole my bicycle, I'm going to call the cops. And guess what cops I'm going to call? I'm going to call the narcs. And I'm going to tell them there's a drug dealer down the street and he took my, he took my bicycle. It, it wasn't about libertarian values. It had nothing to do with free markets. It had to do with the fact that they've spent tens of millions of dollars trying to criminalize what you do. That they want to put a, an abrupt stop to your elegant solution to the world's greatest problem. They don't want people to know that there is a solution that doesn't involve medicine, surgery, right? And by the way, um, the ties of soda and the ACSM and the NSCA and uh, 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 NCAA and the NCCA and who am I leaving out? NIH, CDC, they all have conspired. Go on for a long time. Who? We go on for a long time. We go on like we have emails. 
hundreds of thousands of them, of them in collaboration planning on stopping you. I was like, the NCAA, you're kidding me, really? They're in this? He's, yep, look, here they are, these NCAA guys talking about, got to do something about CrossFit. And I was like, what did we ever do to the NCAA? And then I was like, we don't, we don't even work in the same space. And I go, oh, shit, I know what we did. We got Josh Everett from, uh, uh, what was it, Ohio State? And, and we got... Uh, UC Irvine. Yeah, UCLA later. Yeah. We got Stephane Roche from, he went from Notre Dame to UCLA. We had uh, uh, Michael Rutherford was at University of Kansas. Joe Westerlin was a strength and conditioning coach for Nebraska Cornhuskers. Fuck, we were gutting the strength and conditioning departments across the, across the, the D1 schools. That's what the NCAA may not like about us, for instance. We, we, we don't have full appreciation of how disruptive we've been. But to see all of these organized against us was really, really telling. Um, let me just talk about some of the other litigation, because I want to I focus on the NSCA, both uh, CrossFit versus NSCA and NSCA versus CrossFit. I talked to you about calling them soda whores, and they sued us, and we dropped the suit. Um, we sued them first in federal court, and they're also being sued in Ohio uh, for the same thing. It's a divorce study. It is the most cited study in all of exercise science, in the history of exercise science. It shows that CrossFit was remarkably effective, but unfortunately injured people inordinately. And we had reason to believe from the very beginning, we see this thing that was a fake, and what we did is we brought Latham Watkins and other super law firms um, to Columbus, Ohio, and for the first time in history, everyone involved in a study was deposed. And guess what? There were no injuries. Then in the emails, we got William Kramer of the National, of the National Strength and Conditioning Association, his editor-in-chief of their Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. We actually have the emails where he's suborning the fabrication and falsification of injury data. He tells the guys who say, hey, this CrossFit worked. It had good results. And our study showed that it improved VO2 max and body composition and, and, and physical capacity across the board. Um, and there were no injuries. And he says, we can't publish this without injury data. And he says, let me give you some names of some people that can provide contextualization for this. And a few weeks later, they came back with injury data, and it got published. And we're now in a position where a federal judge has accused the National Strength and Conditioning Association of scientific misconduct. And these are in pre-trial adverse inference sanctions. We haven't even gone to trial. This is all taking place in, uh, in federal court in the District of uh, Southern California in San Diego. We've got a judge that is more angry at the NSCA, our attorneys tell us. And we have about 300 years of experience in the federal judiciary and our legal team. And these lawyers say to the very last man and woman that have never seen a judge this angry before, she has an adverse inference sanctions granted us that the jury will be told that this is a case about scientific misconduct where, where, the, where the National Strength and Conditioning Association, their Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, knowingly published false information on, on, on injury, that this was a competitive commercial effort and not a scientific effort, that this material was distributed across state lines with the intent to hurt CrossFit. It's reasonable to assume that it would hurt CrossFit, and it did hurt CrossFit. I mean, these are all of the elements of a Lanham Act. These are the things that we were going to have to approve to a jury the judge has granted us before we even go to trial. And she accused them of being perjurers by name. We have gotten more out of this thing before it ever gets in front of a jury than I could have ever hoped for. In fact, there's nothing that comes further out of this that's of any value to us other than maybe getting our hands on the building and taking a wrecking ball to it in Colorado Springs, removing this National Strength and Conditioning Association from the face of the earth. They have more debt. They, we got to pick the forensic examiners for this um, in the federal case. They lied to a federal judge. She got pissed off. And we had their servers scraped and their cell phones scraped. And they, there was some spoilation of data for which they were accused of destroying evidence. So we're moving into the felony space now. Um, there were millions of responsive documents that were not turned over to us. They fundamentally refused to comply with the judge's orders. And that's where we stand today. But they have more debt over this case than they'll ever be able to pay. They've been dealt a, a fatal wound. And so my attorneys are asking us, your attorneys asking me, 
What would settlement look like? I'm like, settlement? Like, I think you're missing something, and I really like this. I go, you know that scene in a Western movie where they lasso the guy around the ankles and you hook him to the oh, yeah, and you're dragging him through the desert? Right, off through the brush, you know, you get a free ride. The point of that isn't where is he going. There's no, there's no destination. It's not a, it, until he's done, we're just gonna go in circles. We don't, this is, we can do this forever. I need this thing to settle. It's one of the longest cases in, the, in, the, in, a, in a federal district known for long cases. The judge says, this is making history. And it ain't good for you guys talking about them. I'll do this for another 10 or 15 years. They can't incur enough forensic examination as far as I'm concerned. And the currency of victory for us, it's got nothing to do with money. It's light. It's truth. I want them exposed for what they are, and I want you to inherit the mantle that they've abdicated, and that is a sincere, effective, genuine commitment to the well-being of the people in your charge. Because they don't have that, and you do. And so they're almost fucked. And when this is done, we're going to go after the ACSM. And they're even worse. They're even worse. They partnered with Gatorade on the hyperhydration front. Then they teamed with Coca-Cola at Coca-Cola's insistence and founded Exercise as Medicine, which is nothing more than a concerted effort to get y'all to shut the fuck up about nutrition and forever. It's baked into the Affordable Care Act. And it's the enemy. That's another front. There's been other litigation, but I said I that NSCA versus CrossFit and CrossFit versus NSCA, the state and federal cases are the crown jewels. And I'll come back to what makes them crown jewel, not just that we're beating ass so bad, because we've had other victories. In uh, Gottlieb versus CrossFit, what happened was that a rhabdo attorney picks his buddy up. Yeah, a rhabdo attorney picks his buddy up, takes him to the gym, they do a workout, they go out and eat dinner, have a bottle of wine, and then homeboy, home slice, ends up in the hospital eating jello on the, with the fucking white spoon, you know, and, and getting an IV and watching Oprah all day, and he's looking for 350 grand or something. And we're like, you're not going to get shit for you and your rhabdo attorney asshole buddy. And the RRG fought this thing, and we fought it, and we fought it, and we fought it. What they were trying to do, the pair of them, is set up a cottage industry of suing affiliates for, because I'll tell you what, anyone that does one of your workouts, if he ran right from the gym the, the, the following morning, say, went from the gym to the hospital and had a blood draw, I think you could make a case for rhabdo. I think it's a non-clinical rhabdo. Would that be the term, Mike? I got elevated CKs, but no one's sick. You know, Almick Jones took everyone through Fight Gone Bad, a whole SEAL team and a support crew through Fight Gone Bad, and then that evening did a blood draw, and he said he could have admitted every single person there to the hospital. They all repeated the workout that night with rhabdo. No one was sick. Now, I'm not here to poo-poo rhabdo. In fact, we've been more honest about it than anyone. We, look, rhabdo routinely kills marathoners, and they never talk about it. It's never, put, uh, it's, never, it's never caused serious injury to a CrossFitter that I know of. Ah, that's not true. I think we had a compartment syndrome. There was one. That's a serious injury, very serious. But we've had no, we've had no uh, kidney failure. That case got to the point where we could have settled for $10,000. Home Slice and his rhabdo attorney asshole buddy wanted 10 grand and they were gonna go away. And they were gonna do this next go to visit your gym, then go visit your gym. They were gonna settle for 10,000 pop, should be enough to run in our cottage industry. You know, we said, you're not getting a fucking cent. From that point on, the risk retention group spent a million dollars protecting that 10,000 because we didn't want the 10,000 distributed to each of you over time, and it would have been. So what they did was these guys took several years out of their life, wasted this attorney's ability to earn an income for, for several years, and then the jury gave them zero. Jeff West, Westmoreland approached me, an attorney from Shreveport after that, and he says, that's a shot heard around the world. What's happened is overnight, you've made it harder for someone suing CrossFit for Rabdo to get an attorney that's worth a fuck because any of them were the fuck would look up the history of this thing and see that this was tried before and got you nowhere. It was a good win. We had a bunch of these. In fact, what's the total on litigation? Do we know? Did we hear a number? I think I heard. Marshall, what does that count? Just, yeah, just what's our total everything? IP, the whole total litigation count? High hundreds. And we've lost...
Yeah, we, we lost one out of, out of several hundred uh, bits of litigation. One. You know why? Because we fight really hard and effectively and only fight righteous fights. That's all. We just go after bad guys. And we'll defend ourselves against anything. And by the way, does the risk retention group fight every claim? No, man, there's people have been hurt. We're like, yep, that person needs to get paid. It was clearly something went wrong there. Pull up bar pulled off the wall and you found out a head injury. That's got to be addressed. That's why you have insurance. Kid falls on the bucket and puts a, puts a, a rib through the lung. Right? Like that, coughing up blood right there in the gym. Accidents happen, insurance is for that. We're not gonna let anyone's insurance or any of you set up a cottage industry for some asshole lawyer and his friends. Why is the NSCA piece the crown jewel? I'll tell you why. Because it's been going on for a long time, and it forced on us an education in a whole bunch of things. Scientific misconduct, including fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. We learned about the replication crisis. Uh, we learned about uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, and the replication crisis is an amazing thing in and of itself. But, but we, we saw how it is that peer-reviewed science could be used to get something exactly wrong. We got, to, we got to get up close and personal to the corruption. And there's other issues, too, in the sciences that include things like uh, innumeracy. We've got the p-value fiasco. And... Uh, 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 low-powered studies, um, uh, look at that. the CEU f fraud, pharma reprints is another scam, regulatory capture of the FDA. There's, there's so much that's wrong in science, and we started looking around, and we realized that, geez, what's happening at CrossFit through the NSCA is also going on in medicine, it's going on in psychology, it's going on in economics. It's, it's, it's quite a problem, and, and what we decided to do about this was CrossFit Health. And CrossFit Health is not about your health. It's about, it's the, and they said, let's start with the truth. Here's what I want to do. Here's how we're going to punish the NSCA, the ACSM, Coke, Pepsi, uh, NCAA, NCCA, the accrediting organization for these assholes. Here's how we're going to punish them. We're going to just start telling the truth. About what? About all of it. About all the corruption across the board. And it's been one of the coolest things we've ever done. It's just amazing the number of people that have been able to come forward and talk and give testimony. So, the 14th, we're lobbying, legislating, litigating, fighting liars. And out of that comes what's sure to be a, a, a historical victory in, in the NSCA case. But the, what it does for us is it says, you know what, let's go around and find everyone that knows what's wrong, and let's give them voice. And, and uh, uh, there are people who have an essential message, an important message, that are outside of the mainstream, but no less important. And let's give them voice, let's hub them. We call this the legitosphere. And we said, let's bring them together, let's bring them under our roof and let them talk. And so we've got Gauthier, and Malcolm Kendrick, and Robert Lustig, and Terrence Keeley, and David Diamond, and Gary Taubes. Um, just a, an unprecedented, if you don't know who these people are, um, that's OK, but you need to. And you need to not only know who they are, but you need to know what they're saying, because they're all fundamentally saying the exact same thing from slightly different perspectives, uh, maybe, maybe even in some cases dramatically different perspectives. Uh, but they're describing the same disaster. And I was telling staff here, it would be kind of like if you were to cover, I know Jimmy here was working the uh, 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 hurricane relief in the Bahamas. And there were drownings, being crushed, of electrocution. But it's all the hurricane, right? And that's what these people are like. They've all got slightly different perspectives, um, maybe even dramatically different perspectives. But they are clearly telling the same story. And that is that there's a fixes in to hide the truth from the people. And they, by the way, these people, I got someone from Wales, from Boston, from Scotland, um, from Denmark, Sweden. I mean, this is an international characters. Some of these people, like Ufi Ravenskov, he's, he's, he's just an, he wrote cholesterol myths. 
We first featured that work in 2003 on the, on the front end of the website, and, and we ran for 12 days, the 12 myths. And I was looking, we, just, we were running UFI again, and here it is from 2003 to currently 16 years later. The only thing that's changed is a whole bunch of people have gotten a whole lot fucking sicker. But his message was spot on in 2003, and it, now it's poignant. I mean, it's, it's, it's even more important. It needs to be said louder. I wish I had run the cholesterol myths every month for 16 years. And if you haven't read the book in here, you need to read it. You need to read it. It will make you a better trainer. What's wrong in the sciences, what's wrong with the diet heart hypothesis, um, the problems that we have with the somatic mutation theory of oncogenesis, and, and a bunch of what is wrong, doesn't require you to be a scientist to see that there's a problem. Um, so much of the deceit and the fraud is, is, is pretty straightforward when you look at it. So, let's talk about the website for a bit. Every day there's a wad. Notice the wads are going back to something a little more old school. You seeing that? We're seeing it in the game soon. Did I get a clap for that? I'm not asking, but I just wondered, I hear it if someone dropped something. Yeah, it, it needed to be done. Um, you notice this, uh, this uh, uh, slips stuff? The stretch, L set, inversion, uh, 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 planks, and uh, scales. You know, we've not made much of that, but it's in there and it's not going away. Let me tell you something about it. That is a golden egg. You put it right out on the couch and said nothing about it. There it is, do it. What I'm gonna tell you is that there is more potency in playing with things. Here's what's hard about this stuff, is that it doesn't quantify quite so well, and it's not all that gratifying doing it. It's pretty fucking frustrating, but you will make progress, and to the extent that you do, as soon as you're at a point where you've got even moderate proficiency, say you can hold front, back, and side scales without too much wobbling, Say you can do hollow back and stiff, stiff press, not the planche press. We're not going to make you superhuman, but just two of the better presses. You put that into your belt. You get where you can hold planks, one arm, front, back, side, and roll around like a little top on the, on the mat, wallow around like that. You get where you can hold an L sit for three minutes. And what I'm going to tell you, it's not that crazy. It's really not. It's something that every gymnast can do. The thing is, you first have to hold it for five seconds, then seven, then ten. It comes like that. It might take it might take a few years, but what I'm going to tell you is that someone that develops even just some moderate capacity at these things will have derived more from that than you can take out of the Olympic lifts. It's just a fact. When I was a gymnast, it was the, the, all warm-ups looked like that. Well, here's how it would go in the gym. You'd go in your bag, you'd plop it over against the wall, and everyone gets out on the free X mat and sits down. You leave a space for the tumbling guys. It's really their turf. We're almost not supposed to be here, but here we are. They can't get us off. And then when I was working with some track athletes at UCLA, I went out there, and they were doing the same thing. They'd take their bag, instead of putting it against the wall in the gym, they're out there in the field, and they'd go to, this, to, to the infield, and put the bag down and go to ground and start wallowing around. What can you do in this bag? It's amazing. The things, simple things like the press to handstand, it's learned in the negatives. There's a huge, huge lesson in learning that we do the eccentric. At first, you thunder from the handstand quickly to the ground, right? Boom. Then it goes more slowly and more slowly. I'm talking about bent arm, bent leg, bent hip, making a little curly ball and go down and touch, right, Amy? And then as soon as you can go slow, and then slower, and then more slowly, you will be able to walk up, put your hands on the ground, lean forward until your feet float off the ground and press to a handstand. It will come. And what's really cool is that in controlling the velocity of the negative, we develop an unprecedented strength and communicate to the brain where the line of action is that is the balance for these movements. And so we have a fusion of strength and balance training here that's fundamentally unprecedented. I could go on for this about each of these elements. But this is stuff that everyone should be playing with, and those that are are going to get people further down the road than those that aren't. 
And what else is so cool here is that I'm taking so much of the gymnastics adaptation, in fact, all of it that applies to the general public, with almost no risk exposure. I do not want the general public flipping or twisting or dismounting. You get that? It was one of our affiliates that had a way very successful, nationally competitive, internationally known weightlifter, comes into one of our affiliates that was run by an ex-gymnast, and he says, I want to do that really cool thing where you run at the wall and then run up it with two steps and then backflip and land. And our affiliate goes, that's easy to do. I'll show you. Look, I'm going to do it. He goes, yeah, I want to do that. And he goes, well, here's what you do. You run. Make the left foot hit, right foot hit, tuck, look back. I mean, just spelled it out for him. Yeah, can you believe this is even happening? <laughs> so the guy runs at the wall, left foot, right foot, tuck, perfect, opens up, lands it perfect for about a millisecond, and then both legs exploded. Just shattered. Femur, tibia, all, it, just, it all just gave up the ghost. He broke his legs horrifically. And you're laughing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, what a tragedy. God bless, right? you know? When I heard of this, I, my, I was like, God, I, I need to be kept out of this. You know, I don't, no one should ask me my opinion of what happened, because it won't, it won't be defensible. That should never have happened. You're not going to make a gymnast at anyone, but what we are going to do is reach nicely into the weightlifting stimulus and activity and into the gymnastics activity and stimulus and nutrition. We're going to take the best of it that applies with the least risk to our charges, and we're going to make them better. And this is stuff you got to play with. You just got to, got to, got to play with it. You get where you can do an L-sit. Don't do any ab work. Just do L-sits. Get me to three minutes and go back. Anything you used to do, and you're all going to be sitting PRs, whether it's glute, ham, developer sit-ups, all that shit. Everything's easy with the midsection after you got the L. Like you don't even know why people do these fucking crunches or these or the GHC. You just you don't you don't feel anything. There's nothing there. We get them. We bring in Olympians and ask them to do stuff. It's pretty cool. What else we got? You notice we're on this diet heart hypothesis. Dietary fat does not cause heart disease. It does not. There's never been any evidence that suggests that it does. There have been studies that suggest it do, but they were free of evidence. They were, they were hugely flawed. Hugely flawed. The somatic mutation theory of oncogenesis. Um, the prevailing wisdom is that cancer has its origin in a, in a, in a, in a mutation in the nucleus. There's a fellow named Thomas Seafried and friends who believe that it's a metabolic disease and it has its origins in the mitochondria. I think there's an outstanding chance that he's correct. I think the uh, 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 preclinical, the scientific evidence, especially the uh, nuclear transfer, transfer experiments and cytoplasmic transfer experiments, can't be explained unless you come to something like the metabolic theory. Um, it doesn't really matter who's right or wrong. It's fascinating and it gives us a wonderful opportunity to look at some fascinating science, but what's really compelling to me is that I have not found um, a technical objection anywhere, Dr. Ray, of, uh, of uh, uh, Seafried's uh, theory. And in fact, we had a well-known oncologist at the house, at my house, in the living room when Seafried was talking, and he wrote on Facebook, that he had a great seminar, everyone was amazing, he had the time of his life, but the Seafried guy fucked up the whole thing for him, ruined his weekend, and he didn't like me, he had a bunch to say about him, but he had nothing to say about his, uh, his uh, um, metabolic theory of cancer's origins. And in fact, all of his criticisms were perfectly consistent with the fact that he thinks that maybe Seafried's right. When someone has a visceral reaction to a scientific theory and won't even address the particulars of the theory, um, you often need, you want to look for a reason for that. Now, if cancer is a metabolic disease, and 
I, you know, like I said, it doesn't really matter to me. We get to play, we get to play a nice game with this. Like, maybe it is, maybe it's not. But why such a bad attitude, and what if it is? What implications are there for treatment? They're immense. They would be immense. Doc, I keep coming back to you because you're sitting there so pretty, and I know you're an MD, and we talk to a lot of docs. You know, Gauthier says that a super significant number of, of breast cancer cases remit, spontaneously remit. They don't know exactly how many, but we know this. There was a study done. And it was very, very well constructed with a large N. And what happened is in Europe, they tested a cohort of 50,000 women. They screened them with mammography. And they did so at 50, at 51, at 52, at 53, and at 54 years of age. Another group of 50,000, they screened them at 50, and they screened them again at 54. In the group that was screened yearly, they found 37% more cancer than they did in the group that had two. And I thought, well, of course you're screening, you find it. No, 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 it, it, they, should have, they should have still been there in the ones that were tested over a four year period and they should have been more advanced. And he says that every oncologist in the world that's looked at this has come to the same conclusion. There must be a significant number of breast cancer cases that spontaneously remit. And until we know that number, what can we say about the value of, of early detection? This is, he is, Goche has done more work on mammography than anyone in the world. Also a PhD MD, another one. Brilliant man. A brilliant man. That spontaneously remittance reminds me of a, of a metabolic dis disorder. Genetic disorders kind of look like binary things. You got it or you don't, you know? This idea of this thing coming and going, ebbing and flowing, is really fascinating to me. But again, not important. But it is something that we're, that we're staying on top of because it's, it's fascinating. Scientific misconduct. You all, I want to make everyone an expert on it. We need to know about fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. We need to know about p-factor problems. We need to know about low-powered studies. We need to know about the limitations of, of these epidemiological studies. One of my flow masters was saying that the website had provided wonderful uh, 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 material, wonderful resources, and he referenced opening a nutrition talk where someone before he says, hey, before we stop, did you see the study that said there was a 28% increase of, of, uh, of cancer for meat eaters? And his response was, hey, we can't go into that now with the CERT, but um, they're talking about that kind of science at CrossFit.com. And I was like, that's great. That's neat. You can send people there. But you know, we, we could also teach all of you in short order to offer an explanation like this. And it, this is an epidemiological study. It can at best show a correlation. Anyone that claims that it shows a causation is reading something into the study cannot do. The data for this study, which has the obligation scientifically of being measurable, observable, repeatable, is not measurable, observable, or repeatable. It's survey data from <laughs> memories of what you ate. And what's really interesting here is that someone would call this science. And you can do that with almost all of the epidemiological survey studies. They're not worth reading. There's no one other than the people that do those things that think it's legit science. There's no one other than the people that publish those things that think it's legit science. We're right in the middle of that space. Anatomy and physiology. We're teaching the hardscape with simple plates. Original works done by Lon Kilgore. They're cool as hell. And then the softscape stuff, we never really looked at. You know, I, I can tell you that there's some use to knowing about bones and muscles if you're a trainer. I need to teach you about flexion, extension. It's nice to know the difference between your hip and your knee, right? Your spine and your hip. You know, you, I want to be able to orient you to have discussion. And, but, you know, like, what do you need to know about the liver? or uh, uh, the kidneys to be a good trainer, or the truth is nothing. Truth is nothing. But we are going there, and here's how we're doing it. And I just love this, love this, love this. On the nutrition front, on the metabolic front, what we can do is teach um, anatomy of the eye, of the kidney, of the liver, um, of the vasovasorum, of all of these different parts. We can, we can show you what it does by showing you how it gets fucked up when you get too much carbohydrate in your diet. 
And so there's glycation in the eye, we got it in the sites, we got it at the, at the blood cells, we got it interfering with, uh, with uh, uh, brain function. It's really neat. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of, of the mechanisms of, of the destructive uh, uh, metabolic uh, impact of a shitty diet that we can draw out and show. And you, and you can't show the normal, the abnormal physiology without juxtaposing it with the normal running that stuff, and that's just really been neat to see. I've really enjoyed that. Um, what else we got on the main site? Olivia, the art's back. How do you like that? You can't put art on a website with fitness. Yeah, okay. Um, what else we got from there, Brian? Politics. The battles. All, our, all the battles. The meal videos, you notice those? I call it maximally censored nutrition. If you weren't allowed to say anything, and that is what the dietitians would like to have, you could still do this. There's no words with it. They're each about a minute long. Anyone notice these? Anyone like them? I think they're cool as shit. <laughs> we'll never run out of these. There's going to be thousands of them. They're each about a minute long. The hope was you could watch it and then go make it. You wouldn't even need to leave it open. You just, got it, I can do that. Watch, I'm going to do it. They're, they're identical in their macronutrient composition. Anyone tell me to take a stab at what that is? We could have told everyone, but we didn't. I just wanted them to do so. They can figure it out. What do you think it is? Anyone bother to look? I'm just curious. Mm -mm. No, they're keto as fuck. Yeah. They've got, they've got, they don't tell anyone, make them do the work, but they're uh, 10 grams net carbs, no grain, no sugar. Um, they're 20 of protein and 30 of fat. So they're roughly, if you're, if you're a zone head, it's roughly one of carb, three blocks of protein, and uh, uh, nine of fat. And so these are clearly ketogenic, but they don't say keto. As soon as you say keto, it doesn't taste good to me anymore. I don't want to give it a word. It's, and what's interesting is that in the province of salads, stir fry, kebabs, omelets, souffle, soup, that macronutrient skew is not at all manifest in terms of any kind of culinary sense. You wouldn't look at a 139 soup, stew, salad and go, this is diet. In fact, your big people, the first thing they're going to notice is a day or two in, I kind of would like some bread or, you know, you're really going to have to come face to face with your nutrition. But you would never see in any of these, any sense of where they're made? Does that come out at all? They're being done in South Africa by an outfit that does most of, the, a lot of the filming for the high-end food shows. And so we got world-class kind of videographers here and we just gave them the formula. And it took some playing around. I mean, they didn't really know. No, like, that's too, you know, don't put that in there, please. Very proud of that. It's neat. No one can ever stop that. What else we got from the main site? Good and bad science. Nuggets from L1 through 3. Uh, we are teaching the origins of, and we're building a course currently. We're going to have another course, and it's going to be on uh, modern science and the scientific method. And there's so much to share there. Um, so much has gone wrong. This consensus science that, that is, requires peer review, um, and, and it's found in the universities. It's, uh, it's not modern science, and it's not, it's not, what, it's not part of the scientific method. This is that view of consensus science. And we actually got this diagram from realclearscience.com. And it couldn't be more wrong. Um, there is no voting in science, and, and none at all. And as soon as you say 9 out of 10 dentists believe, you're not, it's, that's, we're, we're, we're outside of the space of science. And the problem with consensus is as a, as a goal to think that that is, is what the, the the effort of science is, what that does is seals the status quo, because the truth of the matter is that advances in science come usually from a single individual doing something that is far from consistent with the consensus. 
And so the fact that a guy like Malcolm Kendrick is being pulled from, delisted from Wikipedia, and this is their language that he didn't give adequate weight to the mainstream view. That's just terrifyingly Orwellian. And what is it that he's saying that's inconsistent with the mainstream view? He's saying that there is no evidence that statins are doing anyone any good. In fact, the evidence that's out there suggests that they're not good for you. And this relative risk that we've been showed, rather than absolute risk, is a parlor trick. And that, and that cholesterol is not causing heart disease anyways. Then there's that. To which Ufi Rabinskov says, that's what I've been telling everyone for fucking 30 years. You're going to have to get out on the floor. And who's got docs in the box? You're talking to them? There was a target for the website in its revamp, 190101. Was anyone surprised by that? You had to be, right? No? Yeah? You saw it coming? <laughs> I was so excited that morning. There it is, you know? It's a crazy curation. Um, Target for the audience. It was the best of my affiliates. And who's the best of them? My 10 year plus guys, you guys. It's for you, it's resource for you. The L1 training cadre, my training staff, for them. And for the docs in the box. And for everyone else in the world with a brain. The others with brains. And I'm getting the right feedback from the right people. We're very happy with what we're doing. Look at that. Affiliate owners, level one training cadre, docs in the box, and the rest of the smart people. That's who the audience is for. This is not a B to C kind of thing. I don't picture your clients coming to CrossFit.com or people in your town going to CrossFit.com and then running into your box. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but it's really not meant for them. It's meant for you resources and education for you, things that we think, things that I'm convinced, if you tucked them under your belt to the extent that you made yourself intimate with the particulars of what we're offering and this steady diet of it, that you're going to be a better trainer. You're going to be able to better articulate what it is that's happening in your gym. And the other th piece to it is really important is that once it really sinks in, I mean really sinks in, that you, have an, you sit in unique possession of an elegant solution to the world's greatest problem, and there is no other possibility for saving, I mean, it changes your posture. And you want to be able to talk about that to anybody, absolutely anybody, to everybody. The problem with this notion that we were going to, that got, that got us here, and I told you it was my, my lovely affiliate that says, what's my 2,000 bucks going for if there's not even a marketing campaign? Um, what, was, what was missed on them is what we have been doing, what you have done is that you are the advent, you are a professional class of trainer that never existed before. A legitimate professional. Um, you're an owner-operator. That's new. You're over half the branded gyms in the world right now. And prior to you, there were owner-operators, but they weren't one in 50 gyms. The landscape was dominated by the Bally's, the Spectrum, the LA Fitness, that kind of thing. And what is a professional, what does it mean to be a professional trainer? I'll tell you some of the things it means to me. Um, it means you're not wearing a little polo shirt with a logo on it and punching a time card. As a professional, I don't think as a professional trainer, I don't think you should be trying shoes on. And, yeah, that looks good. Why don't you walk back and forth with me a few times like the fucking idiot at Foot Locker? I wouldn't sell shoes in my gym because I'm not a shoe salesman. I'm a professional. I'm not going to sell you water either. You know why? I owe it to you. I charge you enough money that I can get cold water. We, put it, we installed a water fountain that, that triple filtered and chilled. Bring your own bottle and fill it up. Well, you want to go to your lawyer and, and, and can I have something to drink? And he brings you a bottle of water and wants a buck fifty? You are something that hasn't been before. 
And we're not going to let it go. We're not going to give it up. We're not going to endure any perversions of it. If you're selling bar, you know, would I sell t-shirts at my gym? Fuck yes. For profit? Fuck no. Why? I want people proud of what's happening in there, and I want them putting a shirt on, proud of themselves, proud of me, proud of their friends, proud of each other, and I want them walking around proud in town. And if the shirt, if the shirt costs me $15, I'm going to pass it on for $15, because I'm not in the apparel business. And by the way, we're telling Reebok, we're getting out of the apparel business. I don't want apparel revenue. I don't want to be in the shoe business. That's not the business we're in. I lead a group of wonderful, wonderful souls that sit in unique possession. What's unique about it? Well, there's other people that can parrot a lot of what we do, but, but every other attempt to do something about chronic disease is an idea that has found no implementation. What you're doing is not theoretical. You unlock your doors every day. It's real as fuck. The people that come in there are getting very, very real results. It is not a theoretical construct. It's happening. And so people look at CrossFit Health and go, this isn't really about, this. it's different. I ever thought it was going to be about it. I go, no, 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 we've, we've got the health thing covered in the gyms. That happens there. They sit in unique possession of an elegant solution, the world's greatest problem. It's it, that we took care of that. What we're doing at CrossFit Health is exposing how it is that we were left to come up with this when no one else would or could. You found a way to make money telling the truth. And what stands against you is all those people that lie for a living. And there's a lot of them. They're never going to extinguish you. They're going to try, but it won't happen. We're going to learn to coexist. They're never going to go away. I, you, you ask me, you know, you, I, I like sharing this with you, but I have absolutely no hope for the public health. None at all. One of the things we learned, I, 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 I didn't go here and I should have, one of the things we learned from the NSCA and, and looking around the corruption and seeing how it is that consensus science can be so wonderfully, easily, readily purchased, what we learned is that everything that's wrong is wrong on purpose. And so if you look at healthcare and you think that the goal is to make people live longer and live brighter, healthier, happier lives, and the whole thing looks like a failed system and you can't make sense of it. But if you realize that there's a disease economy and that everything that's wrong is, is, is wrong on purpose and that there's people for whom this flood of dialysis and diabetes and obesity is the best fucking thing that ever happened, those people number in the millions, and their economy is worth trillions, and nobody wants it to get anything like better. Now, who do, for whom do I have hope? Anyone that comes through your doors. For her, for him, for them, I have perfect hope. Perfect hope. But there won't be enough of us. There's not going to be a million affiliates. We're not going to be able to, we're not going to, be able to save everybody. But we can save, we can make a huge impact on everyone that comes through the doors. I like that. What I'm describing is job security. There won't be a mass conversion event. There's not going to be a New York Times headline that says CrossFit right, world wrong, and then all of a sudden everyone's flooding into the gyms. That's never going to happen. You're going to live your whole life being called quacks, frauds, and fakes. And you're going to be healing people in large numbers. And that's never going to end. And everyone is going to know that you have the goods, that we have the goods, that we sit in unique possession of an elegant solution, et cetera. And they know that as sure as they know anything that, that they know. And this includes the 20,000 physicians sitting in the boxes. We've started networking and we're doing these MDL ones. You know what that is? It's the same fucking L1 you took. But everyone's sitting there as a doctor. And then we get to come up to them afterwards and tell them that, that it's hopeless. Nothing's going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And it's not your fault. And sorry. It's a, it's a little odd, but uh, it's cool. Um, we need that resource. We need these doctors' network. And it's working. They're really a lot of fun. Um, the, the current landscape is really hard for the docs. It's really hard. And uh, they feel better when they, when they mingle with us.